Hello students, this is Dr. D.A. again. We are going to give you the introduction to this experiment. It's actually experiment number 12 in your lab manual, vapor pressure of water using the clausius clapeyron equation. I gotta thank my uh, colleague, Professor Don Nice Warner for providing the slides for this. And so we're gonna use her slideshow for this presentation here. If you remember we discussed in class, if you have a, let's say a flask that is stoppered and it has water in it at very low temperature, essentially you have liquid water with dry air above it. As the temperature increases, vaporization of the water begins so that some of the molecules of water become vapor. Slowly but surely, molecules of vapor water are also going to collide with the surface and not have enough kinetic energy to overcome the forces of attraction of the water molecules, and so they will condense again into the liquid phase. After a while, what will happen is the rate of vaporization will equal the rate of condensation. At that point, you will have not equal amounts, but a steady amount of vapor molecules. We call this state equilibrium. If we could measure the pressure above the liquid water at equilibrium, we could say that was the equivalent of the pressure of the gas phase being exerted over the liquid phase of the water. We're going to call this the equilibrium vapor pressure. And what's important is that the vapor pressure of a liquid is proportional to the temperature. The relationship is not directly linear, though. The clausius clapeyron equation is an expression for transitions between the vapor and the condensed or liquid phase of a substance. And here is the expression. In this equation, LNP is the natural logarithm of the vapor pressure. Natural logarithm is using base E instead of base 10. Delta HVAP is the standard heat or enthalpy of vaporization of the liquid. R is the ideal gas constant, but in this case, we don't use the liters atmospheres units, we use joules, and that's the value you can see over there. And T is the absolute temperature, that is the temperature in Kelvin. This constant C here uh, is not something we're going to be evaluating in this experiment. Some of you may have forgotten what the natural logarithm is. This was proposed by Euler a couple hundred years ago. Essentially, if you do a graph of 1 over x versus x, that is the reciprocal of x versus x, you get a curve with a downward kind of slope. If you ask, what is the value of x for which the area under the curve between x equals 1 and x equals whatever this value is, is 1, that value is e. E is the base of natural logarithms, and like other numbers such as pi, it's one of these extensively, you know, never-ending numbers, approximately 2.71828. The important thing is that E is the base of natural logarithms. So if you take the natural logarithm of A and the result is N, what that means is that E to the N equals A. Why do we use E instead of base 10, which is the more familiar logarithm? Well, this is something that's used in several fields. For example, in economics, it is used to uh, project the growth of investment portfolios, the uh, calculations of accrued interests, also in demographics of population growth and stuff like that. So it's a very important statistical function. And that's about all we need to know about it. Your calculator should have a button for calculating natural logarithm of a number that you put in. The important thing about the clausius clapeyron equation is that, as you can see, it has the format of a straight line, y equals mx plus b, where m is the slope, b is the intercept. And so, because the relationship is linear, a plot of the natural log of p versus the reciprocal of the temperature should give us a straight line. The slope of that line should be minus delta HVAP over R. And since we can calculate the slope and R is a constant, we can use this ratio and the enthalpy of vaporization can be obtained this way. So our objective is to examine the relationship between vapor pressure and temperature using the clausius clapeyron equation, specifically for water. We're going to determine the vapor pressure of water as a function of the temperature. 
Then we're going to use the vapor pressure data to construct a clausius clapeyron plot, which is log of P versus 1 over T. And using the graph, and specifically the slope of that line, you will determine the enthalpy of vaporization of water. These are the objectives for this lab. As usual, we have to be concerned with safety. Even though we're working with water, we still have to use safety goggles because we are going to be working with hot plates and hot water. Also with some glassware that could break. Particularly, be careful with the thermometer to prevent that when you insert it into its cork holder, it doesn't break and you know hurt your hand when you're doing that. This is the preparation for the lab. You're going to gently slide a magnetic stir bar into a 1,000 milliliter beaker that is placed on a hot slash stir plate. You're going to fill it with tap water and begin heating, heating the water in the beaker. Meanwhile, you're going to add a copper wire loop, kind of tie it loosely around a 10 milliliter graduate cylinder. Again, it has to be loose because you have to be able to slide the graduate cylinder through that loop. You're going to fill the 10 milliliter graduated cylinder to about the 10 milliliter mark. Remember, the graduate cylinder extends beyond the 10 milliliter mark. Cover the thumb with, the, with your thumb and invert it so that you will have a trapped air bubble of about 4.5 to 5.5 milliliters. If you don't get that size of a bubble, try it again. Now what you'll do is very carefully place the inverted graduate cylinder into the beaker. Don't release your thumb hold until the cylinder is submerged so the air bubble remains in there and place it so that it is touching the bottom of the beaker. Now with the copper wire you looped on it you can attach it to a ring support so that the cylinder is slightly suspended but submerged in the water while still being able to be slid up and down. You may have to add more water to the beaker in order to cover the bubble that is inside the inverted cylinder. You want for that bubble to be essentially surrounded by the water on the outside of the graduate cylinder. Make sure the inverted cylinder is near the side of the beaker so that when you start stirring the uh, stir bar, it will not hit your graduate cylinder. Now you'll attach the thermometer, which will be suspended. It'll be submerged in the water while being held from a cork clamp in onto a ring stand. Try to make sure the thermometer bulb is near where the air bubble in the graduate cylinder is resting. Here we see our colleague, Dr. Mary Perot with the setup. You can see there the large beaker with the submerged graduate cylinder being held by copper wire from that ring support. And then you can see the thermometer that is held by a clamp through a cork that has a slit in it so that you can read the markings inside the thermometer even if the temperature is uh, somewhere inside where the cork is. Here is a sketch of the setup and you can see how the uh, graduate cylinder is submerged so that the water surrounds the air bubble. Okay, when you begin the experiment you're going to be heating the water without stirring until the water temperature is about 78 degrees or so. At that point, you're going to turn off the heater and turn on the stirring. The purpose of stirring is to make sure the temperature is evenly distributed throughout the whole water bath. The way you're going to do this is you're going to be reading and recording the volume of the air bubble by reading the scale at the bottom of the meniscus. Now notice that because the graduate cylinder is inverted, the meniscus is actually also inverted. You'll read it to the nearest hundredth of a milliliter and making sure at each data point you've recorded the temperature to the nearest tenth of a degree Celsius. Now this is very important. As the temperature in the water rose, it caused the air inside the bubble to expand and also water to vaporize and contribute also pressure from the vapor of the water inside that bubble. So the bubble has increased in size and right now it is submerged under the level of the outside water. It is very important in order for us to get an accurate read of the pressure 
that we carefully slide up the graduate cylinder and set it up where the meniscus inside the gra uh, graduate cylinder is level with the water on the outside. When we do that, then we can be assured that the pressure, the total pressure inside the graduate cylinder air bubble equals the pressure on the outside because the pressure on the outside is the one that we're going to be able to measure using a barometer. So at every data point that you take a reading, make sure you slide up the graduate cylinder and equalize the pressure inside with the pressure on the outside. We're going to take our first reading whenever the volume of the air bubble is below the 10.00 milliliter mark. So if the volume of the air bubble is above that, you will need to wait for the water to cool because we have no accuracy of measurement above the 10.00 milliliter mark. Once you've taken your first reading, you'll take readings at five degree intervals until the water has cooled to about 50 degrees Celsius. Don't forget at some point to record what is the barometric pressure. We'll typically have a barometer either in the front of the lab room or in the, by the window of the stock room. <coughs> For the final reading, what you're going to do is take a reading of the volume of the air bubble at zero degrees Celsius. So you'll need to remove a lot of the water from the beaker. We'll use a large syringe with a rubber attachment to it. You may have to repeat several times until you have about half the vol volume of water left. Now make sure you don't disturb the air bubble in the graduate cylinder, okay? Now, very carefully with the stirrer on, we're gonna add ice until the temperature is about you know, two to zero degrees Celsius. Make sure the ice doesn't go inside the graduate cylinder. Remember, ice has a different specific heat than liquid water, and you might affect the way uh, heat is being transferred in the process. Add enough extra ice to make sure that the water level is again higher and that your bubble is sort of submerged inside water, although at this point you have water and ice. So very carefully add more ice if you need to. Once the temperature has settled somewhere between zero and two degrees Celsius, you can stop stirring. And at that point, you can slide up your graduate cylinder and take your final volume reading. The important about this uh, data point is that at zero degrees, the water should have close to zero vapor pressure, which means that the air bubble you have in there is all dry air. We're going to need this to make some of the calculations as we adjust the pressures of the air bubble at different temperatures so we can subtract the pressure contribution of the dry air and we can focus exclusively on the vapor pressure of water at the higher temperatures. Your data, of course, is going to consist of several things. Don't forget to go by the stockroom window and check the barometer for the barometric pressure on that day. Make sure that you are reading your volumes of your air bubbles at different temperatures. Remember, you always read it at the inverted meniscus. And don't forget to slide the cylinder to make sure the pressure is equalized. You always have to take this volume reading at a pressure where the uh, pressure inside the grad cylinder is the same as the outside. After you reach the 50 degree uh, Celsius mark, remember after that is when you're going to add uh, ice, so you're going to remove about half of the water in the beaker, replace it with ice and maybe more water, and take your final reading somewhere around 2 degrees Celsius. Anything below 5 degrees Celsius should be fine, actually. If you run out of time, if you're already below 5 degrees, don't worry about trying to exactly make it somewhere like 0 to 2 degrees. As long as it's under 5 degrees Celsius, it should be fine. So your post lab will consist, first of all, calculating the number of moles of air that are trapped in the air bubble. And we're gonna use the reading at zero degrees Celsius and the ideal gas to calculate how many moles of air are in there. At the higher temperatures, there is no change in the moles of air. What changes is the partial pressure of that air, which we need to subtract from the total pressure so we can calculate the actual vapor pressure of water at each temperature. 
Once you have the data collected, you'll make a graph of the natural log of P versus the reciprocal of the temperature. And then using the line of best fit, the trend line and its slope, you will calculate the heat of vaporization of water and then calculate what is the percent error. How does it compare to the value reported in the literature? That is going to be our lab. In our next video, I'm going to walk you through a set of sample calculations. You will be provided then with a data set for you to analyze and do a graph with, and you will submit your lab report by uploading your data in Canvas. Thank you so much. I'll talk to you soon.